I'd like to thank the organizers, especially Dr. Vijay here for inviting me. And uh, so today, Yeah, good morning and welcome. Uh, so today my talk is about surgery for brain metastasis. Uh, I'm Dr. Prakash Shetty. I'm the professor of neurosurgery at Tata, Tata Memorial Hospital. So this talk will basically cover like what patients are referred for surgery for brain metastasis. How do these patients present? What is the evidence for operating a patient with brain metastasis, what are the different clinical scenarios which we get patients for surgery for brain metastasis. And uh, towards the end, we will see what are the different types of surgeries, what things are used in the surgery, and what is the evidence for their use in various types of surgeries. So to begin, uh, the brain tumors, the most common tumors are the brain metastasis. They are three times more common than the primary brain tumors themselves. This is because CNS tumors account for only 1% of all the cancers, primary uh, cancers in the body. And approximately 8 to 10% of uh, patients who have systemic cancers will develop brain metastasis. And lung, breast, melanoma, colorectal carcinoma are the most commonest cancers which metastasize to the brain. And the incidence is increasing because of prolonged survival and these patients have a longer time of survival, hence more chance of developing brain metastasis. And also there is increase in the radiological surveillance, which again shows up patients having lots of brain meds. So coming to the common presentations, it is headache, you can have a focal deficit, you can have cognitive dysfunction, seizures or stroke. And coming to the radiology, so the CNS involvement can be parenchymal or it can be a dural based met or it can be a leptomeningeal met. So generally the parenchymal met is due to a hematogenous spread and they typically occur in the gray white junction. Is it on? You can see, sorry. Want to switch, girl? I'm sorry if you missed the slides. So, so coming to radiology, so generally these are uh, tumors which occur at gray white junction, usually multiple more than single. And they throw up a lot of edema, which is seen in this T2 image. And uh, generally the supratentorial region has more amount of brain meds because there's more volume in the supratentorial compartment compared to the infratentorial. So coming to the next question, what is survival in patients with brain meds? So untreated, the survival ranges from one month to 27 months has been quoted. From 1950s to 1980s with WBRT, the survival range from three to six months. However, now with targeted therapy, it has gone up to two to three years. However, the overall survival is still dismal and it is 6% at two years. So why does brain met require special consideration? So first is the patient has a tendency to develop neurological deficit, which affects the quality of life. There is a risk of sudden and irreversible death due to the raised ICP, which may cut short the patient's life. There is presence of blood brain barrier, which sort of acts as a sanctuary, which sort of prevents entry of specific drugs and which can cause the tumor to grow due to a sanctuary site. And also there are short term and long term complications of therapies which are given and due to prolonged survival and which may affect the quality of life again. 
so goals of therapy are to achieve good control both in extra and intracranial compartments to minimize short term and long term side effects of the therapy and to maintain quality of life so coming to treatment options so generally if if it is a local or a focal problem then you address it by surgery or radiotherapy surgery or radiotherapy can still be used to achieve local control or palliation even when the disease is systemic and chemotherapy is generally used for systemic disease and sometimes for local disease in a few cancers so how do you prognosticate a patient who develops brain mets so how how can you sort of prognosticate or tell how much he will survive so this uh, is a paper which is a re recursive partitioning analysis of 1200 patients in three rtog trials who were subjected to wbrt so the best the worst survival was found in class 3 and which included all patients with kps less than 70 and it was 2.3 months the best survival was in class 1 which was kps more than or equal to 70 age less than 65 controlled primary no extra cranial metastasis and these patients had a survival of 7.1 months and the rest of the patients were clubbed together in group 2 which had a survival of 4.2 months so what has happened is in the last two decades there has been considerable shift of patients from class 1 and class 3 to class 2 making the treatment decision slightly more complicated and difficult and this rpa analysis has been validated in a number of uh, retrospective studies in patients with brain metastasis so coming to role of surgery so suppose you have a controlled primary with brain met solitary brain met and usually these are rpa class 1 patients because the primary is controlled no systemic mets so you do surgery it prevents the risk of immediate death due to raised icp and the patient can take further treatment and patient will do well however if there is disseminated disease with brain met either solitary or multiple these patients usually will fall in class 2 or 3 rpa class 2 3 so surgery would prevent immediate death due to raised icp but in spite of that the patient continues to progress in spite of the surgery because of the systemic disease so surgery is usually indicated in rpa class 1 patients and we it is quite logical why we do surgery in class 1 rpa patients so this is seen in this flow chart which was uh, published in jco again so generally the functional status kps more than 70 you have controlled extra cranial disease and if you have a single met then the option of surgery arises surgery plus wbrt or srs plus wbrt so rest of the conditions you don't see surgery anywhere so the key predictors for survival in patients with brain mets is age kps and the extent of extra cranial disease so are these factors influencing survival irrespective of the histology means are all these factors important in all the histologies so for that there is a disease specific graded prognostic assessment so this is based on analysis of 4000 patients and for lung cancer it was found that age kps presence of extra cranial mets and number of mets was important for prognostication however if you see for gi cancers only the kps was important but what we are seeing is that kps is a important score which is seen in most of the cancers so this is a gpa sheet for a breast carcinoma so you have all the factors and you would have the score and you would sort of add up the scores and you would get the survival by gpa so whether it's 6 months 13 months 36 months whatever so coming to which type of brain mets respond best to surgery so whether it's solitary mets oligomets or multiple mets so coming to solitary mets so there were three randomized trials which were done in the early sort of 90s and uh, two of these trials so these were basically trials which looked at whole brain rt versus surgery plus whole brain rt in a solitary metastasis so two of these trials found a survival advantage and one of the trials did not show the survival advantage so coming to the details of these trials so the first trial was by patchel et al so it was a rct with solitary brain mets surgery plus wbrt versus biopsy plus wbrt in 48 patients so they were stratified for location extent of disease primary tumor etc 
So in the surgical arm, you had lesser recurrence and increased survival, 9.2 versus 3.5 months. However, it did not affect death due to systemic causes in patients with disseminated disease. And also to note that 11% of patients had alternative diagnosis and biopsy. So this also should be kept in mind. Not every lesion in a patient with cancer is a metastasis. The second study also found a survival advantage, 10 months versus six months. However, when there was active extracranial disease, the median survival was just five months, regardless of the treatment given. The third study was MINTS et al., which did not find a significant survival difference. However, most of the patients in this had active systemic disease in a lower functional status compared to the other studies. So there is class one evidence to support the use of surgery plus whole brain RT compared to whole brain RT in patients with good performance status and with limited extracranial disease. So coming to the next question, is surgery better than SRS for solitary brain metastasis? So this ANS, CNS panel said that there is no level one evidence to support one over other. There is level two evidence to support that both are equal in efficacy. And level three evidence that SRS can be used as an alternative to surgery plus WBRT, provided there is a readily availability of resources to detect these recurrences and salvage therapy afterwards. So coming to the next question, that is SRS versus surgery plus SRS for a large solitary brain met. So again, this was a trial by Prabhu et al. He had 66 patients who were in the SRS arm and 157 patients who were in surgery plus SRS. And the large met was defined as more than four uh, cubic uh, centimeters. And gross total excision was required for inclusion in this trial. So the surgery plus SRS arm had a higher tumor volume, 9.6 versus 5.9 cc. And it reported better survival, better OS, reduced local recurrences. And this shows the critical role of surgery in a solitary large brain met, even in the era of SRS. So is surgery indicated for multiple brain mets? We do get this question many times. So generally surgery is not preferred. So there is a case control study by Bindal et al. He said that complete resection of two to three meds, maybe if they are close together in, that you can get them out in the same incision, had a better survival than incompletely resected meds and it was equivalent to resection of a single met. Similarly, Peck et al. found surgical resection of multiple meds as it improved survival, especially in RPA class one patients with limited extracranial disease. Uh, similar, this thing was reached by URRT also. So this evidence is not robust, but it can be considered on case-by-case -case basis. So what is role of surgery in recurrent meds? So we also get these types of patients who have been radiated for a uh, met and then there is growth in that same cavity. So what should you do for those? So same that Bindal et al. So this is a small cohort of patients showed that resurgery in a select group of patients can improve survival and quality of life. Again, this is for RPA class one with limited extracranial disease. So and Arbit et al. in a case series of 214 patients also showed prolonged survival after resurgery. Our thing to remember is that surgery is difficult due to previous therapies and the risk of morbidity is more in these cases and proper selection of cases is required. So what about surgery in irradiated meds? So again, the, there's not much evidence, but it may help you to clarify to know whether it, it is a recurrence or a radiation necrosis. And in a study by Vessel et al about SRS failure, the patient who underwent surgery after SRS failure had a good survival of 11.1 months and 25% patients survived for more than two years. However, these were again class one and class two RPA patients. And the additional brain meds which appeared were treated with aggressive local therapy. So this is the evidence for previously irradiated brain meds. So coming to what is the role of surgery in lung cancer? So this is a special section driver mutated lung cancer with brain metastasis. So the role of local therapies has been challenged in these cases. Also, because of prolonged survival with targeted therapy, you have to think again about local therapies because in the long term, there may be some side effects like cognitive decline, which may show up, which are part of the local therapies. 
also brain mets are more common in these types of patients either due to the molecular biology or because these patients survive longer so coming to different clinical scenarios lung cancer with driver mutation so if you have a solitary dominant met with impending herniation you have no option but surgery here the second is at primary presentation you have an operable primary with a solitary brain met then you can operate the lung as well as the brain met so you can have sampling of tissues from both sides for driver mutation suppose if you have a patient who has brain mets with advanced non small cell lung carcinoma then probably chemotherapy or tki you have a symptomatic solitary met with driver mutation you can offer tki suppose there is only intracranial progression on a tki so the options would be either give a second line tki or if patient is unaffording due to any reason then surgery if it is a limited disease there is a surgical role there or rt if it is extensive in these cases if there is both intracranial and extracranial progression then you could probably biopsy the extracranial site and decide for non mutated cancers it will be similar to what is practiced in the other cancers so what is what is the role of surgery in leptomeningeal disease so there is no direct role for surgery however you can place an omia reservoir for a less painful access to give chemotherapy and to sample csf so the question is which patient should be sent for surgical opinion so from what we have seen the ideal candidate would be controlled a prime stable primary with no extracranial metastasis kps which is more than or equal to 70 age less than 65 and a solitary mets so surgery in other than ideal criteria so this was an ideal criteria so suppose the patient presents to you in a emergency condition where the status of the systemic disease is not known so as a life saving procedure surgery can be offered and then you work up the patient later so this may be one of the clinical scenarios which you can encounter suppose the patient comes with low kps but this low kps is attributed to the brain met he has a lesion which is close to the motor cortex and there may be edema which is sort of causing that weakness and which may improve after surgery so these patients may still be considered for surgery suppose you have a uncontrolled systemic diseases so it can have two or three presentation so at initial presentation the patient has never been treated so this patient you can still give offer surgery but in a patient who has failed multiple lines of therapy with uncontrolled systemic disease this is not an ideal candidate for surgery in the question of age whether less than 65 more than 65 so the rpa doesn't look at comorbidities so generally a fit patient of 75 years with no comorbidity may be preferable to a patient who is 60 with multiple comorbidities so again this has to be kept in mind so what are the benefits of surgery so one is immediate relief of mass effect there is improvement in the kps there is decrease requirement for steroids and steroid dependence comes down and also associated complications with the steroid use it establishes csf pathways hydrocephalus in posterior fossa brain mets is an example it can optimize seizure control you can establish diagnosis so whether it's a tumor or whether it is treatment related change or it's a new primary in the brain or whether it's an infection and it offers survival advantage in solitary or single brain metastasis so coming to the treatment decision so after selection of the patient the surgical selection is based on the eloquence eloquence means whether the area surrounding the met is has lot of function important function like motor speech etc and the surgical risk which is there so it depends on the site of the tumor as well as the comorbidities of the patient so the final treatment can be taken in a joint clinic with pros and cons of alternative treatment modalities which are available so in summary neurosurgery is indicated in a patient with good performance status controlled systemic disease solitary brain met non eloquent location symptomatic large maybe it is resistant to radiotherapy 
and there is availability of therapies after the surgery and of course you have to take into consideration the patient and family preference for a particular therapy it is not indicated in a patient with poor performance status uncontrolled systemic disease and multiple brain myths so coming to clinical scenarios where surgery is indicated is just a repetition in a case format so the patient should have good performance status and control primary so a solitary brain met which is symptomatic causing mass effect and in the non eloquent area surgery is indicated solitary met with an unclear diagnosis surgery is indicated and mets from a relatively radio resistant tumor surgery will be indicated so this is a example a 44 year old female ca ovary stage 3 underwent surgery and chemo bfi of 1 year presented with headache vomiting attacks here so <coughs> so on imaging you can see a large parietal met here it's causing mass effect and we don't know there is some enhancement here not sure so there is no met elsewhere so the plan was surgery followed by radiotherapy the second scenario where surgery may not be preferred so even though the patient is in good ps controlled primary if it's a very small mat it's a pinpoint mat or maybe 2 3 mm then surgery is not indicated or it's at an inaccessible location the second this thing is when it is in an eloquent area basal ganglia brain stem motor speech cortex so these area areas you can operate provided you have equipment or adjuncts to deal with the surgery which is required here otherwise if you are not able to have those equipments or adjuncts then it is better not to operate a tumor in the eloquent area and the options for this will be srs for tumors less than 3 cm so again example of ca breast who had completed primary treatment dfi of 9 months presents with weakness in the lower limb you can see this tumor is have a small tumor but with edema which is sort of near the leg area and causing this weakness so the options would be srs here surgery can be done provided you have the adjuncts so scenario where surgery is not indicated one is a poor performance status an uncontrolled primary multiple brain mets again driver mutation in the lung so a solitary lesion with driver mutation you can proceed with systemic therapy if no mass effect or symptoms patient on tki and growing intracranial tumor sanctuary site second line therapy or surgery rarely you can biopsy to plan therapy as sometime the primary and the intracranial tumor may differ in their expression so this is from our clinics as 66 year old female al positive metastatic adeno ca she was started on crizotin a partial response for one year patient developed progressive disease in the lung and solitary brain metastasis and was unaffording for the second line so she was planned for rt to the lung and brain met excision followed by radiation so you also have to remember an alternative diagnosis so this is a case of 45 year old locally advanced ca pyriform fossa was given two cycles of neo adjuvant and presented with weakness and hemiparesis you can see this lesion the differential was between a met or an abscess and the final hpr after surgery turned out to be an abscess so you need not write off patients which you see with multiple mets you can have a, this should always be kept in mind the other clinical scenario is palliation poor performance status you can put shunt or as reservoir or debulking of symptomatic mets if you can do it so coming to what are the various neurosurgical techniques for brain mets so coming to the medical management in the pre op patient so the edema you can have which is common so you can treat with corticosteroids or you can treat with mannitol or 3% ns obstructive hydrocephalus you can put a temporary extraventricular drain or a vp shunt seizures can be controlled with anticonvulsants and if the tumor is close to hypothalamic area then you need to evaluate for the endocrine functions so what imaging are needed for a pre operative patient with metastasis brain metastasis so generally for a non eloquent tumor which is not close to a functional area a plain mri brain with contrast or tum brain tumor protocol can be done but if it is close to an eloquent area then you will require mri brain with contrast 
you will also require a dti which is uh, a diffusion tensor imaging and a functional mri so coming to dti so it it helps us to visualize the various tracks which are close to the tumor and it helps in surgical planning so you apply a magnetic field and the water molecules align along the axis of the neuron in different magnetic strengths and you can generate the tracks based on it so you have something called as adc and a fa value so the fa value gives us the direction of the molecular displacement so this is a paper which shows different applications for this dti so generally this is an fa map you are not sure you can see these are the tracks which are generated and when you add color it becomes a color map so basically it is color coded according to the directions if you have fibers which are going transversely they appear red fibers which are going in anterior posterior directions are green and which go from up to down cranial to caudal they are appearing purple so you can differentiate various tracks here so just to show an example this is a tumor in the thalamus and you don't know where the corticospinal tracts are but you can see it has been displaced on the periphery it has been split and displaced according to the dti and you can see it again here on the images again here <coughs> so this is a crane case of metastasis so you can see the edema here and uh, you see the fa map which is showing reduced and isotropy however in the color maps you can see the fibers are preserved so the fibers are still there and because of edema the fa value has become low but so this patient can have a good outcome with surgery so this is again a high grade tumor glioma so here even the color map has decreased so this is showing infiltration with destruction of the tracts so again a high grade tumor here there is like a black hole basically and nothing seen on the color map so all the fibers are destroyed here so this is the conclusion dti provides important information for surgical planning and influences surgical outcomes so gross total resections are achieved in 61% of cases with displaced fibers compared to only 31 with infiltrated or disrupted fibers so this is a thing dti is, that is where the requirement of dti for eloquent area tumors so this is just to show some tracks this is the corticospinal tracts which sort of starts from the cortex here motor cortex descends down and goes into the spinal cord so this is the uh, speech tracts basically so this is the dorsal stream so you have the arcuate fibers which are shown here and uh, this is again a part of the speech system this is the ventral stream ifof and the uncinet so the next imaging is this functional mri or which is a bold imaging so basically when you are doing the mri you give patient some task and this will cause a increase in the blood flow in the corresponding area of the brain and this functional mri is for the cortical areas the dti is for the subcortical areas so this is an example so when you ask the patient to speak in his mind or generate verb so you get some Uh, sort of signals in the cortex so based on the anatomical location then you say okay okay this is the broca's area where it is lighting up similarly you give patient some task to move his lip and again you can find out where the lip area is or where the motor cortex is so coming to the next question what is the role of extent of resection in brain mets <laughs> so this was a paper by tendulkar et al he showed that there is survival benefit in gross total resection 10.6 months versus 8.7 months versus a subtotal resection in solitary brain mets the p value was not significant so again in a study by lee et al 157 uh, patients of solitary brain met who were operated and majority receiving rt the extent of resection was associated with survival and the median survival was 20.4 months when a gtr was achieved versus 15.1 months when subtotal resection was achieved so what is the role of surgery in te surgical technique whether it's a block or whether it's a piecemeal resection so generally what is found that 46% of resected mets will recur locally only so the a block resection is favored over piecemeal resection as it lowers the risk of local spillage and recurrence and also the leptomeningeal disease 
and some people have even said ki you should resect more than 5 mm beyond into the normal parenchyma to reduce this risk of recurrence so coming to onco functional balance so what is this onco functional balance so normally you want to resect as much as possible as clean as possible but as you get closer to the eloquent areas the risk of resecting more will cause neurological deficit so you want to resect more while you want to sort of preserve the neurological outcomes also so how do you do this basically so there are some intraoperative adjuncts which help you to increase the tumor resection as well as preserve the function so to increase the tumor resection sorry you can use uh, modalities like navigation intraop mri ultrasound microscope etc and also you can use fluorescence dyes like phi ala has been used and to preserve neurological function there are specific techniques like intraoperative neuromonitoring and awake surgeries so what type of neurosurgical procedures one is a routine craniotomy and excision of brain mats for a non eloquent area tumors the other will be craniotomy and excision for eloquent area will require awake surgery or will require general anesthesia with intraoperative neuromonitoring third type of procedure is biopsy and you can have shunts or reservoir placements so coming to adjuncts which are used in eloquent area tumors so one is intraoperative neuromonitoring and awake surgery so question is when will you do each of them so the functions which can be monitored under general anesthesia you can monitor the motor system with mep sensory system also you can monitor so these patients will be fit for uh, surgery under ga with neuro monitoring but there are some functions like language speech reading semantics memory executive function apraxia which cannot be monitored under general anesthesia and these people will require awake surgery for preserving the function so what is the role of ionm so it was found that whenever you use ionm the gross total excision rates increase when you don't use them however there are lots of early deficit 36% versus 11% but in the long term it decreases it becomes lower than when you're not using mapping so 3.4 versus 8.2 so the clinical implication is that in a low grade tumor you can use ionm even if you get lot of deficit you can wait the patient will improve considerably but in a high grade tumor you cannot afford to do that because there will lot of time will be lost in taking the adjuvant therapy and finally the patient may not do well so this has to be balanced so generally <laughs> the ionm the intraoperative neuro monitoring for motor basically you can stimulate the scalp which is over the motor cortex or you can stimulate directly the motor cortex and you can record that from the spinal cord or you can record that from the muscle so this is called as a mep so you can have a transcranial mep <coughs> or you can place a strip over the motor cortex stimulate and record from the periphery that is the strip mep d wave is recorded from the spinal cord and another important thing is this dynamic suction so whenever you want to sort of stimulate you want to sort of map things you want to know how far the fibers are you had to stop again monitor again get back to surgery so this is a monitoring system which is built in the suction so as you get closer and closer to the tracks it will give you a beep and you know that you are close and you can stop your surgery in coming to awake surgery it is for preservation of higher mental functions so indications are ever expanding now you they say you do awake surgery for everything so it can it is used for language memory executive function personality so many things can be sort of preserved but it requires a lot of experience and sort of you increase your skills over time so it is done under scalp block local anesthesia and iv anesthesia and the patient is awake during surgery tumor resections and all these functions are actively tested to preserve them so what are the other adjuncts to increase the extent of resection by visualization so you have an intraop mri but it is very expensive time consuming but it's a gold standard the other option is a stereotactic or a navigation neuro navigation which is called so basically it matches the preop mri of the patient to the patient and so that you can navigate where those structures are 
but the uh, problem is that it is based on the pre op mri so as you resect the tumor the csf flows out it becomes inaccurate so this is a problem of brain shift the other imaging modality which you can use is intraoperative ultrasound it is easily available cost effective and it's real time so you can scan you can resect you can scan you come to know how much tumor is left and this phi ala has been used for malignant gliomas where the tumor would fluoresce under a specific filter when you are operating and it helped to push the resections so it has been tried in brain mets also so the results have been varying so sometimes the brain met may enhance show the fluorescence sometimes it may not and even after resection of the brain met the parenchyma below may show enhancement sometimes so what is the implication of this so 66% of brain met showed fluorescence with phi ala so that's why it is not used very commonly so the phi ala tumors negative tumors which did not fluoresce were associated with high risk of local progression though os was not affected in a recent paper show that if the surrounding brain shows fluorescence then these patients are it is associated with angiogenesis and a risk of local progression and what are the various biopsy methods available you can have a stereotactic frame, frame based stereotaxy then you have frameless options to biopsy which is a navigation and the ultrasound so coming to complications you have neurological deficit infection seizures the morbidity rates vary between 3.9 to 6% mortality is 0.7 to 1.9% so in summary surgery is indicated in patients with solitary symptomatic non eloquent brain mets in patient with good performance status controlled extracranial disease surgery in other situations can be considered on an individual basis as the evidence is not robust decisions can be taken in a joint clinic and various surgical adjuncts are used to make surgery safer and complete so i'll just show you one or two videos if we have time so this is a video of awake craniotomy so you can see the patient is awake and this is the brain which is exposed so you need to map so the patient is awake you initially you stimulate the motor area you can see the hand twitching in the patient then you come to the speech area and then you sort of ask the patient to speak so when you stimulate there is a speech arrest the patient stops speaking so you know that that is a speech area so that is how the function is localized you can play the video so this is left frontal tumor close to the motor and the speech area so we are stimulating for the motor cortex here so you can see the hand twitching actually so you know that is a motor cortex so we are asking the patient to count we are simulating the speech area now so you can see patient speaks and then stops so she is not able to speak now so that is the speech area basically so then you sort of localize where the motor and speech are then you can begin the section this is at the start of the surgery but you have to keep on doing it in the cortical as well as subcortical areas for awake surgery can you play the next one so next one is basically a video of for the tumor which is uh, sorry i'll play the other one okay so this is a tumor which is located close to the motor cortex and you will require to use adjuncts like uh, neuro monitoring to preserve function so the surgery can be done for eloquent area tumors this is just a video showing that so this is a lesion which is there in front of the motor cortex here so it's a localized lesion like a mat so we need to preserve the motor functions here so generally this is the craniotomy in dura is open you can see the brain now you are not unable to see where the mat is so this is a strip which is placed on the motor cortex so you will stimulate the motor cortex through this strip and record from the periphery and you can see those signals on the neuro monitoring machine basically so the 
this is the recording which shows you the signal from the upper limb basically. So we keep on stimulating to tell you okay, the upper limb is fine. So this is how we use the ultrasound to sort of find out where the tumor is. You can see the tumor on the ultrasound here. It is not seen on the surface but you see it with the ultrasound. The and this is the suction which I was telling you which can tell you how close you are to the tracks. It beeps when you get close to a yellow point area. This is a specialized suction with a stimulator. One more video actually, which is the biopsy procedure is how we do a biopsy. So this can be applicable for any lesion. So this is a biopsy of a thalamic lesion. So it is done with an ultrasound guidance. So you can see the tumor here bilaterally. So generally you have to do a small craniotomy. We are doing a training from the building of the building. We are getting the skull bone on. And you require to drape the ultrasound probe. So this is the draping of the ultrasound probe. which is attached to the ultrasound so it helps to keep the needle always in your side so you are attaching this guide here on the side then you insulate to decide which trajectory you want to go so there are three trajectories this is one two and three so you make a small hole in the dura there so you can see these three trajectories this is one Insert a stereotactic needle. And whichever trajectory you have selected, it will go according to that trajectory. There are three trajectories here, you can see. So this is one, two, and three. So this trajectory is in the needle path. This is along the tumor. So you can see the needle advancing. So it's a real time procedure. You are able to see the needle advancing.
Can you withdraw the needle basically from that side? These are the cores of tissue which come out from the knee, from the biopsy cell. So this is an example of an ultrasound guided biopsy. You can have similar biopsy using a steroid neuro navigation. So then you insulate after the biopsy, you see there is no hematoma. And usually a post-op CT is also done. the wound is closed now. So this is a post-op CT which is showing you the biopsy site here. There's blood at that site. It's small. Linger. Yeah, that's about it, I think, for my presentation. Good morning, sir. So yeah. how much is the morbidity and mortality associated with the brain biopsy? It again depends actually what equipment you have and it depends on a lot of factors. So like some areas which are supratentorial may be easier to biopsy. Again, depends on the patients. If he has the condition, basically, if he is high risk for surgery from anesthesia point of view, complications will increase. If he has any blood dyscrasia due to chemotherapy or something, again, the morbidity increases. And uh, supratentorial, you can biopsy, but again, if you have seen that it's a major procedure, means it's not like a needle inserting in some minor OT or something. You have to, it's planned procedure, takes two to three hours. It's just like any other surgery, except that you're removing a smaller piece of tumor. So it can be done provided you have all these equipments, patients is not a very high risk for sort of bleeding complications and other issues. And the site supratentorial should be okay. In front and brainstem biopsies are a bit more difficult, so it can be done. Thank you, sir. Any other question? Manavi? Aditya, any question? Sir, I, I have one question. Uh, so if it's a, we have seen that multiple times in multidisciplinary clinics, if it's a single lesion, but if it's in the posterior fossa, yeah. We preferably do a neurosurgery procedure, and why is that? So the chances of deterioration with the posterior fossa lesion are much more. So basically, if it's a met in the posterior fossa, it sort of compresses the fourth ventricle. So there is a back pressure change, and you get hydrocephalus because of that. So there is more chances that patient will deteriorate with the posterior fossa met. So even for a hematoma in the posterior fossa in neurosurgical practice. So if the hematoma is less than three centimeters, it can be conserved. Anything bigger than that, even if patient is asymptomatic, you go in and remove that tumor or hematoma. So because of the tendency for it to cause hydrocephalus and sort of herniation after that. So, so these are slightly a, sort of dangerous areas which you need to sort of monitor or operate at a shorter distance. Any other question? Do we have any question online? Just check. Size so ideally they say that for all other cancers we say that a solitary met should be operated they have not said the size but if it is something like one millimeter two millimeter five millimeter then some of these may it may be a too big a surgical exercise to go in and remove that and any of you are going to give srs or something after that so these can ideally be controlled with srs so size criteria may be smaller lesions, minuscule lesions, you can still go, you have other options. But if it's slightly larger, three centimeters, something more than that, and causing mass effect and all those issues or pain. So then you can definitely you know, sort of go in and uh, operate that patient. The single but hemorrhagic met, uh, do we operate? Yeah, why not? If it is causing mass effect, then you should operate.
for all other mets that is a criteria means for us means you have many options like srs but then we saw that if you do srs then you should have sort of keep the patient under constant follow up so that you are able to intervene if there is progression so all those things are there so the easier option would be maybe you excise that met if it is large and mass effect is there and give either srs or wbrt whatever is required like if if there is a met and it's very close to the eloquent area like if it's grow and it will involve it very soon so will we operate even though the patient is asymptomatic no preferably not actually preferably not so generally what we have seen in clinical practices that even that small met which we see close to the motor area so you may give radiotherapy but sort of the many time post radiotherapy the edema sort of increases and patient has that extended neurological deficit for a long time sometimes which may force you to intervene many times so, so it is not that with radiotherapy a close the tumor close to the eloquent area will do well even there they would have problems like increasing edema neuro deficit which are continuing so those issues are there but if you have adjuncts like what we have shown if you have neuro monitoring and all those things then you can probably offer surgery there thank you sir so if there are no more questions uh, thank you sir that was a very eloquent talk where we came to know about not only when to do surgery how to do surgery and it was new learning experience that if it's speech and language then you would profit and avit can you tell me if it's motor or that you could do an ion ion monitoring so one more question is uh, will, would you do amart tractography uh, for nearly all patients or only if you are so which which were the patients you would say that we need to do an uh, mr tractography yeah so these sort of um, for a non eloquent area like you have a tumor which is in the frontal lobe or maybe posteriorly occipital lobe or maybe the right side temporal lobe so these are not that eloquent you, you need not do tractography but if you are planning to operate a tumor which is near the motor area or which is near the speech area then you will require to do dti but it is not binding as a means because the gold standard is still the intraoperative stimulation the dti will show you okay this is a tract here but only on stimulation or only on mapping that you will come to know that that there is a tract there is so if you are not able to do but you can still do ionm without that also but preferably it is better to do it so it is like many times it is used for presentation documentation prognostication so it, the role is that but you can still avoid it and go do directly ionm if it is available so one more question uh, let's say in the dti you see that the corticospinal tract is displaced as opposed that it it sees that the tumor is completely infiltrating infiltrating in the cortical does that change the management plan for with respect to neurosurgery then and so you can prognosticate the patient in the case the tract is displaced you can say that the surgery will be beneficial and then the chances that you will improve your the kps will improve but if it is infiltrating again you can prognosticate the, your condition will remain same as it is there is not going to be any improvement in that case most probably you may think of alternative less invasive modalities like radiation or this thing. navin so uh, th thank you sir so we'll move on with the next lecture for the